Okay. Good morning, guys. This is um, this is the uh, this slide is will be the cover of my next book uh, that I've been working on for quite a long time. Um, the, uh, and so, what I'm going to talk about today is the review of a book that's not yet pre published. And my uh, what I'm going to talk about just covers a small part of what I put plan to put in the book. Um, most of it's based on fact, and some of it's based on opinion, which I have a lot of, but um, my opinion is uh, based on 40 years or so of experience in the auto industry. That, so um, it's not 100% created. But um, this is my uh, my 65. Uh, I've got a little green bar across the top. Do you guys have that? Yeah. Well, that's okay, Tom. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, I purchased this, this uh, Corvette in, in uh, April 21st, 65. Um, it's got a Dow Smith body on it. it uh, it's a L79 350 of uh, a four speed positive traction and all that good stuff. Um, I uh, ordered it through the uh, reliability test program. And uh, so I specified the body to be a Dow Smith body. I went to, I went to Ionia and watched the body come down the line. Quite an interesting story i uh, um, as it was uh, about halfway through the trim line they were putting the windows in it and i knew a lot of the operators because i spent a lot of time there and i walked up and said hi to this fellow that was trying to put it together and he said <laughs> he said boy i sure feel sorry for the poor guy buying this car and i said well that's mine and he said he couldn't believe it so he just threw the, the parts in the inside and he said we'll finish this up offline he said this is this we can't do this now so it got a lot of special attention. Uh, the body had some special uh, bond material put in the back uh, where, the, where the roof panel meets the underbody. And it, um, because there, were, there was a lot of bond burn in that area. And so it's an interesting car. I know where it is, but I'm not supposed to tell anybody because I didn't find out legally. So anyway, that's that was my Corvette. Uh, the outline, the, the um, what I want to talk about is the, uh, how the C2 is a new car, completely new. I want to talk a little bit about the rationale for the C2. You know, um, uh, Corvette was never very profitable. So um, the, um, the notion to, to produce a new Corvette, I don't think was very popular, really. And then I want to show you a little bit about the timeline, things that had to be done, just some of it, some sampling, talk a little bit about the tooling, the first 23 jobs that were built, which uh, a lot of us are familiar with. And then <clears throat> I ran into a guy named um, uh, Paul Hazard who designed the T-top for 68, and I thought I'd just throw that in. The, uh, <clears throat> the Corvette is, a, is an iconic car. Um, and normally when we think of an icon, we think of a graphic symbol like is on our cell phones. And uh, But the Corvette, when you see a C2, you know that's that represents a Corvette. You can recognize it from from a, a long distance. So it really is an icon. Now this is a uh, this is a prototype. There's a lot of discussion about what a prototype is, and and when they were built, and what their contribution was to the program, and so on. But a prototype is built by engineering for engineering validation before release. It may not even be a complete car. As you can see, that's a 61 or two, whatever, with the 63 front end on it for the front end evaluation, for airflow, and so on. So the, um, the, the prototype would not likely ever be released to the public for, uh, for sale. And, and a, pilot, a pilot line, now, <clears throat> it's built by manufacturing engineering for manufacturing after engineering release and a pilot normally a pilot is uh, assembled with enough advance of in enough advance of production so that whatever is discovered to be not not uh, easily managed by production can be corrected so the uh, the part the pilot line if there ever and most people say there was no pilot line a friend of mine that uh, worked <clears throat> worked in the uh, engineering area at the time, and I've talked to him a lot, George Haverling, and he said there was no pilot line. Well, the first 23 are sometimes called pilots, but they're really not because 
they were followed up immediately by production. So it can't be, they can't really be pilots. Then, and, and so production obviously is after pilot. And there's supposed to be some time after pilot, like I said, for corrective action uh, with full assembly plant personnel um, in, in production, of course. So then after, you know, after engineering uh, releases the job, you know, it's a little bit different in those days. When, I don't know how it is now, but in those days, styling, styled the, the car, and when they turned their styling over to engineering to, to complete the, uh, the, engine, the design and engineering of the, uh, of the content, styling was pretty much finished. When engineering released all their drawings, and they were pretty well finished. They turned it over to manufacturing and they were pretty well finished. So, um, and they all, each moved on. So in those days, product engineering made the corrective action as needed so the car could be produced. So as problems arose down the production line, it was product engineering responsibility to make those corrections. And Bill Hart and John Scheibel in St. Louis were the champions of that, that activity. Now, uh, marketing knew that, Shelley Marketing knew that Ford uh, was gonna release a new sport, sports car. And there was a lot of chatter about, uh, this was after, you know, I started in Chevrolet St. Louis, August of uh, 16th of 62. So this, some of this is, is information that I gleaned along the way, but the marketing knew that Ford was gonna come out with a sports car. And they wanted to beat, they wanted to be ahead of Ford. So the 1961, the first mass tank prototype was produced. In October the 1st, 62, was the target announcement of the 63 model Corvette. So it was close together. On October the 7th, the Mustang formal debut at the, United, the U.S. Grand Prix at Watson Glens, New York, took place. So Chevy was right in there uh, with, with the release of the Corvette. But the... Um, um, the Corvette really wasn't ready to be produced, but they pushed it because they wanted to beat Ford. Now, you know, to in 1960, when they were trying to get this car out, there was um, there was some resistance, I, I, I'm sure, because we heard it afterwards. And at that time, GM gross sales was 12 billion 700 million. Their net income was about a, about a billion. Their net income percent of sales was about seven and a half percent. And the Corvette production was 10,261 jobs in 1960. So Corvette contribution of about $3,800 a piece each was only about $3 million, uh, which is about 2.4% of sales, which is not very much. So what does it cost to launch a car like the Corvette that was 100% new? I'm sure it was a good chunk of that two, two uh, three million. And then what's the benefit to the corporation? Well, financially, it wasn't much. You can you can figure that out. So it was, wasn't easy. I don't think it was easy for marketing to get this job done. But marketing needed the Corvette because the Ford 64 and a half Corvette, or uh, uh, um, Mustang, was out there and they needed to compete. So they got the job done. On April the 1st, 1960, the design work order 28,000 was released. Now they called it, they said it needs to be known as program 28,000, not Corvette, but program 28,000 because the uh, um, secrecy was, was important. Uh, the target release date to manufacturing was March the 1st, 62. Now, that's not very far in advance. It's 23 months from program identity to release to manufacturing. That's pretty quick. Um, you know, most um, new cars takes five years. It's a five-year cycle. Um, and then October the 1st was the announcement to the dealer date. That's seven months from the release to manufacturing to, announce to, to uh, announcement to dealers. That's, I think that's extremely quick. This is the actual um, design order. Um, sitting here at home, we can read it on there, but I suspect it might be difficult otherwise. But 
Um, and all this did was provide a uh, mechanism for the various engineering departments to charge their time. On May the 6th, a confidential organizational letter from uh, 63 Corvette program from Carl Jackos, uh, who was the assistant chief engineer, <clears throat> to Jim Primo, the chief engineer, said there would be two models, a smooth back coupe, a convertible to include a removable hardtop, the bodies of plastic reinforced with steel, uh, steel where necessary. Pre-test car program would be as follows. There would be a chassis test unit, a coupe shell car, meaning it wasn't functional, it was just a, a shell for evaluation of, uh, there'd be an aero coupe and a convertible and two prototype cars to be built. In September the 60, Pruno, this is 17 months before the release to manufacturing. So they suggest the use of phenolic aggregate tooling, uh, sometimes called um, Kirksite. If you um, have been around the industry very much, Kirksite tooling was used for short runs, and they make they can make uh, you know, Kirksite tooling can be cast right off of the uh, die models, the wood die models, and uh, so it's pretty quick tooling to make, and it'll run in steel, maybe a hundred parts or two hundred parts, maybe. In plastic, it could run maybe several hundred. So it was a quick way to uh, to get things going. But at this time, the windshield and the side windows weren't complete. The design wasn't complete. And that's only 17 months before the release. On December, Duntoff wrote to Primo, which was 13 months before release, and had a wind tunnel test at up to 140 miles per hour. And had a, a decent report, said it was, was okay. They also said that uh, similar experiments with Le Mans Corvettes showed satisfactory windshield wiper operation up to 150 miles an hour. I thought that was kind of interesting. Who drives in the rain at 150, except maybe race car drivers? So uh, that's kind of interesting, I thought. On February the 23rd, another chief there was a lot of assistant chief engineers and chief engineers, I found out. But Barr was a chief engineer, and he, 12 months before release, he, uh, they, they arrived at a decision on the disappearing headlights. So now they're one year away from releasing the information to manufacturing and purchasing and so on, and they're just now figuring out how they're going to do the headlights. And, and that sizable amount of, in, of engineering and uh, testing, you know, headlights are safety. And uh, testing means cycling for verification, who knows how many times, 100,000 times maybe. So they set it up and let it run uh, open and closed, open and closed until it either runs to failure or to some predetermined amount of cycles. So it's, it's uh, just releasing a part is pretty, pretty big deal. Now, this is uh, part of the wind test. The, uh, it, the area right over the top of the car that's kind of cross-hatched, that's negative pressure, also over the front of the very front end. The darker areas are positive pressure. So when at, uh, at, at say, 60 or so miles an hour, uh, the, uh, the wind, as it goes over the car, you know, uh, moving air is creates less pressure than static air. So it creates a little bit of a vacuum over the top of the car. Um, uh, and and the, that can create lift. Now, Duntoff wrote this. He says he tried a 63 prototype on the proving ground, and at 150 miles per hour, I felt front end lift, and I was losing control. Aerodynamically, the car was at the limit that it could do, and at the point of becoming a bad airplane. So... From the previous slide where the shows the uh, vacuum over the top of the car, it's pretty easy to see that how at high speeds the car would tend to lift. And I suspect it raised up enough to uh, um, take the slack out of the, the um, suspension. 
Okay, the, 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 on March the 17th of 61, there was a program progress report. And seven of the more than 20 items discussed. Now this is a month, this is 12 months to the release. So they, they have now received corporate approval. They didn't have that before. So they're only a year out and they finally got approval to spend the money, I suppose. There was a four passenger model was approved. There was a small deck lid after the backlight for the coupe. You know, you can envision between the, the rear window called the backlight and the gas cap, there would be a little door or a little like a trunk lid that would open and allow storage items back there. That was proposed. The power seats were to be available option. I have a drawing of the power seat framework that was never released. Uh, there would be a prototype coupe by December the 1st, prototype convertible by December the 15th, and they would add one four passenger coupe to the schedule. Well, by the way, can everybody hear me okay? As we, I guess uh, you can just raise your hand a little bit, maybe <clears throat> let me know that you're okay. Okay. Uh, this is the four passenger coupe, or yeah. And <laughs> reading about this was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I never saw one. I think they actually did build one or two. And you can see there's four guys in it. The guy, the driver's got a hat on. Uh, the story goes that uh, a bunch of these guys got down into the, in the styling, whatever, and they were looking at it and they got in it. And the guys in the back couldn't get out. Um, they had to practically crawl out. So it was really just not practical at all. And I remember at the time my dad said he would buy one, a Corvette if they could have a four passenger. And he had heard that there was a four passenger. But I never heard of it. I never heard about it. Not, not when I was working there. So February of 62, Primo uh, wrote a letter to the assistant staff engineers, design engineers, and project engineers. And he said that the 63 programs were behind schedule, seriously. And when somebody at a high level says they're seriously behind, that that gets people's attention. So start of production changes were to be avoided. And the only way they could get a change, if it was needed, was to uh, get high, high level management to approve it. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the timeline for releasing a new car is critical. As it gets towards the end, they're always, they always run out of time at the end of the, at the, end of the race. So this particular part, the, um, um, the coupe door upper inner panel is not the drawing. That's the steel part. Um, it, it, part number ends in seven, seven, three, and four. The, um, the small detail in that circle is where the de where it is not the drawing. And there's a little clip there, you can see it, that um, holds a piece of trim. And I, it, it was always difficult in the factory. They were they were very fragile. They didn't work very well, in my opinion. But um, the way that, the reason it was not the drawing is because the the, uh, the design. <clears throat> if you made it to design, it would die lock, meaning that if you could close the die, you'd never open it. Uh, and really, it means the die won't even close. It, it just you just can't make it. So uh, my friend Don Babcock, who was the primary buyer for all the Corvette stuff at the time, sent the bid packs out to a few su suppliers and um, they all came back no quote. So he inquired, of course, and they said, well, it's dialogue, can't make it. And so he went to Bud, who he had sent a quote to. The Bud company was huge with Chevy. They made the uh, uh, C-body front fenders, that's the, that's the Impala front fenders. And that's huge. You know, that's that's hundreds of thousands of units. So Don says to Bud, do you want to make the front fenders? And they said, well, yeah, of course. He said, then you'll make this part. And they said, well, you can't make it. They said, he said, just get as close as you can. Because we didn't have, there was no time to redesign it. <clears throat> so Bud made the part. And I guess they made it pretty good. <clears throat> they were a good stamper. Their front, their front uh, fenders for the C-body were a whole lot better than Chevrolet's. Um, a lot of good examples of that. So anyway, that's that's the kind of stuff that really slowed down procurement. 
because we send out bid packs, bid packs come back, bid packs go out again, the tooling people, it takes a lot of time. It can be three or four weeks to or more. So then we got a letter from Bunky Nudes and found it in his diary in April of 62. He talked to Jim Goodman, who was executive vice president of the corporation, about moving Corvette to Willow Run because St. Louis needed more space. And that was true. They did, did need more space. On August of 23, uh, in August, Ed Cole, who was the vice president, um, said he wanted to move the, the uh, to give Mitchell Bentley the four passenger Corvette to get the uh, station wagons away from the. Uh, I didn't realize that, that um, Dow Smith was <clears throat> not very popular. So. Now this is August of 62. The assembly line was beginning to fill. September the 4th, the, the, fill, the line fill was complete. <clears throat> September the 4th is the first day I walked into the factory. Uh, that was Tuesday. And um, the line were, lines were full and there were cars in the repair areas. At that, and in October, Bunky uh, confirmed the four passenger Corvette was out. He got he got um, some of the high guy, high level people to, to agree. Um, then on September the 13th, <clears throat> he um, addressed the Los Angeles Dealer Association. And on September the 23rd, the press release was announced to the general public. So they beat their, 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 their target a little bit. As you recall, they said they wanted to have the, uh, the release to the public on October the 1st, and they got it out there on the 23rd. So. That, um, the organization did an excellent job on that. Um, you know, you think about line fill to um, re in, in, in the time from between the 1st of September, August, because the last 62s were built at the end of July. So they had four weeks to remove all the material from the, all the 62 material, load all the 63 material to the line, set up all the new tooling, uh, fortunately, the front end and rear end uh, skin assemblies, it only took 120 volt for a vacuum pump and, of course, a compressed airline. And perhaps they had to train the operators uh, because the car was all new and the operators had to learn how to build it. So that's pretty fast turnaround time. Now, these are the tools as received. Um, they're brand new. They're in, they're in uh, Flint <clears throat> at the Van Slyke plant. And you can see um, see that they're new, obviously, because they're clean. Um, the um, in the picture at the top left, there's a little fixture back in the shadows there. That is to assemble the um, the rear differential and prop shafts <clears throat> and spring sub assembly. Hey, Larry, Tom yeah. Ding, you want to take a question now or wait till the end? Oh, go ahead. That's all right. We're doing all right. We're we're in good we're in good time. Yeah. Uh, Jim Williams wrote a chat message that says all of this info is in Bunky Newton's diary. Question mark. Um, whenever I say, whenever I mention his name, it is. <clears throat> I've got copies of uh, out of his diary. Got it from the uh, uh, Detroit Public Library, I believe. Also, would you just say a couple of words about? what Mitchell Bentley is. Well, Mitchell Bentley, Don Mitchell, and I don't know remember Bentley's name, but they, um, they owned the Ionia plant. And um, about the time, and they were building the uh, Seabody station wagons for Oldsmobile and Buick from about 1958 to 1964, I think. And uh, General Motors was pulling the wagons away from it in 64. The contract ended because this, the 65 wagons were different and they weren't going to retool it. So um, uh, Mitchell Bentley saw the writing on the wall and they went after the, uh, the, uh, the Corvette. They went after some extra business and they got the Corvette. Uh, there was a little bit more to it than just that. But um, at any rate, the uh, Corvette was kind of to replace the station wagons. Well, um, Don Mitchell was getting old and I think he was getting, I, I know he was elderly and he was, but they wanted to, um, so they sold it. They sold the, uh, 
but was Mitchell Bentley to the alchemical. No, they sold it to A.O. Smith. After a short period, A.O. Smith and Dow Smith got together because Dow Chemical wanted to make uh, fiberglass reinforced plastic parts, which they did in the, uh, as, when they got the, the, the company. <clears throat> and for a short time, Inland Chemical was involved too, but they got in and they got out. So uh, it became, Mitchell Bentley became Dow Smith. Um, of course, Smith, A.O. Smith is a pretty good sized company. They made the frames for Corvettes in uh, Granite City. So that that's uh, a little bit of background on <clears throat> on um, on that. It's interesting. Uh, there's a there's another article. I we don't have time to really discuss very much, but there was uh, some uh, thoughts of moving the Corvette from St. Louis to Flint and outsourcing the bodies to Dow, Dow to well Dow Smith <clears throat> because. Dow Smith was only about 70 miles down the road from Flint. Um, but that all fell through. So does that do it? Yes, thank you, Larry. Go ahead. Okay. Now, this is the, uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's 116 of these kind of black and white pictures. The vast majority of them are taken at the Van Slyke plant. And this is for tooling tryout. You know, General Motors would never buy anything without inspecting it and proving that it would do the job it's intended to do, whether it's a car part or a, a tool. So they, they set the tools up and they use them to satisfy themselves that it will produce the kind of assembly that it's supposed to. And then they, then they pay the supplier. And in the meantime, if it doesn't, of course, the supplier has to fix it at their expense until it's right. So the, uh, this is some of the pictures. The, uh, that's you know, the left door, the, the rear upper panel, the bird cage weld fixture, the bird cage checking fixture. I tell you, I spent a lot of time on that checking fixture. We, um, uh, I ran a whole bunch of bodies, our, our uh, bird cages through it, and I checked them. Uh, each one of those little feelers or uh, uh, templates requires a quarter inch feeler. And you can see the guy measuring there. You can you can measure down if you got good eyes. You can see down to ten thousandths. So you can get some pretty nice uh, uh, studies off of it, off of that kind of a fixture. Now this is uh, the top right hand picture is the one I told you. That, uh, that's what they assembled in that little fixture in the back. And of course the lower right is putting it into the chassis. Uh, the left side there, that's George Heverling with his hands on the drawing. George was kind of a dominant guy. And then the guy that's second from the right is uh, Dick, Dick Fraser. He was assistant uh, superintendent to Ed Teske. And the other two guys, I recognize them, but I can't recall their names. I, I knew them, but I, and this is, in, this is in Flint as well. This is at the Van Slyke plant. Uh, because it, it, it says up there, uh, Corvette employees only, because at that time, it was still a pretty a well-guarded secret what they were doing. And if that was St. Louis, there, would only, only, there could only be Corvette people in the plant. So this is Van Slyke. Um, okay, the first 23 jobs. I, I spent a lot of time researching these, these jobs. <clears throat> They're not pilot in the true meeting, as I already talked about, <clears throat> because pilot... <clears throat> has to be uh, built before production with enough time for corrective action. So they're not probably really pilot jobs, but they were the first 23 built, obviously. Um, a lot of Chevrolet do documents, the guys that write them talk about doing things on the pilot line. And they're talking about this, this 23 first build, but they really aren't pilots, not in the true sense. Um, most of the fiberglass parts were hand laid on the, uh, on these first 23. Um, you, there's lots of pictures. You can see the cloth. The first 23 jobs assembled in St. Louis um, were assembled in late August or early September. And um, I think some of them, were, I think the first one was produced in, in June or July. Um, and I happened to write, I, and this is really, I, I'm, I'm really surprised. <laughs> I found a, a document in my drawing, in my, I'll show you a picture of it, that I, uh, I inspected. Then 16 and 17, I wrote down the serial numbers. 
and it had to be in the first week or two of September. I, I, I was so shocked when I found it. Um, so this is uh, Brian Richardson's uh, Ben 3. He restored this himself. It's a really nice story about uh, the, Brian, how he, uh, how he found it. He, uh, um, he, this, he bought it in 1970, 1975. He paid $1,500 for it. He, uh, he, he was a young kid. He was 19 years old. He wanted a Corvette with uh, fuel injection and a lot of other really nice options. And he reasoned that if he could get a low serial number, it would probably be a, a, a well-loaded car. So he went to the uh, California Department of Motor Vehicles and asked them to do a search for the first 20 VINs. And this one came up. So he um, uh, contacted the guy that owned it. Uh, he was uh, in the uh, in the throes of divorce. He, the guy didn't want the car anymore. It was in a, in a kind of a barn. It was dirty. The radio was missing. He um, um, made the guy an offer, and they negotiated. At any rate, he, he and his brother went down and got it towed it home. He lives in, of course, Riverside, and or I mean, I'm sorry, Campbell, California. Um, but the body tag does not have a, a date code on it. So there is no there is no body date. That's why I think it was built in June or July as a as a uh, car that was used in assembly to help determine how to lay out the plant, where to put materials, help train the operators, and to see if the car would go down the assembly lines. And so I think it was late June, early July. There were some because it was so early, it had major differences, as you can see in this photo, these photos. The um, Trim, the trim on the window didn't run all the way to the front of the door. The, uh, the door outer panel where it met the uh, trim panel was different. So it's uh, it's got a lot of very unique differences. Okay, the next one, this is Deb and John Barger's uh, um, car. They live in Wentworth. Um, John bought this about 1975 as well, and... Uh, he believes that Ed Cole once owned it. He's starting to restore it. He, uh, he's a body shop guy. Um, very interesting person. I, I, I invited him to attend, but I guess he's not in the crowd. Um, but uh, do you see that? that uh, they call it a Fox uh, vent behind the door, uh, just above the character line over the left rear fender. It's a single scoop. And I've had a lot of guys ask me how they convert that to, to, to a two scoop. And I said, well, you know, it was molded as a two scoop. And I'm, uh, so that's a good, nice point of discussion. But anyway, I, somebody customizes. Um, this is uh, Bob Jensen's, uh, Bill Jensen's uh, number 13, lives in Huntington, New York. Um, it's, he uses it a day driver. Now it's got a body tag date of 7B. And 7B is another point of controversy. Um, you know, Fisher Body uses a system where one is January, two is February, three is March, and so on. And A is the first week, B is the second week, and so on. So 7B to me says it's. Um, it came off the line in the second week of July, 62. Well, uh, because, now uh, the reason I believe that is because uh, Chevrolet St. Louis had, of course, a large Fisher body plant hooked on it. And everybody knew uh, pretty much what was going on at Fisher as well as Chevy. And they, uh, and Fisher, that's, that's Fisher's system. So, I can imagine a launch meeting when the guys are sitting around discussing all the various problems and there was a ton of them. And I can envision somebody saying, well, hey, are we going to put a bill date on the, on the body tag? And somebody said, well, yeah, we probably should. What do you think? And they said, well, Fisher uses, a, you know, a alphanumeric code. And they said, okay, that's fine, go. So they start that way. Then uh, by the time they get a few more built, they say, wait a minute, that's really not, we want something more accurate. So they started with the uh, A for August in that particular time and a number for the date. 
Now, this car was originally accepted for some nose damage uh, that he had fixed, but he uses a day driver. And uh, he said, somebody else, he says, if somebody wants to restore it, they can do it. He said, I'm not doing it. Okay, this is Peter Bakari's uh, trio. These are some really beautiful cars. I was down in uh, Harvey, Louisiana in 60, in 19, or in 2018 to, to see these cars, and they are, they are really gorgeous. Um, the um, uh, 15 has a body tag of, eight, of August the 17th, 16 is August the 17th. And 17 is August the 21st. So there's, um, I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, uh, Peter had a guy named Ken Hansen of Medina, Tennessee, uh, work on these cars. I think he restored them and he did a splendid job. I, 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 they were, you know, no paint job ever came out of St. Louis factory like that. This is uh, Jerry Bramlett's. Um, Corvette from, he's in Mobile, Alabama. This is number 18. Um, it's got a build date of August the 23rd on the body. He bought it in 90, 1991. He got it out of an abandoned storage yard. He sent me some pictures of it when he got it. There was no front end on it. There was no engine in it. Um, it was really a mess. The uh, steering wheel was laying on the floor. It was, it was really dirty. Um, the, um, and Jerry rebuilds fuel injection and he uses it to test units before he sends them to his customers. So that's that's Jerry's car. Now this is uh, Rick Rensselaer's number 20. And <laughs> I, I, the first time I called him was about that date right there, May of 2018. And I got a hold of his wife, Pat. And she said, uh, she was kind of, uh, she said, I can't wait to get out of California. The fire out here, she, their house burned down and to the ground and they lost everything and she said she was up in her bedroom reading and somebody from across the valley called her and said uh, what are you doing and she says well i'm just reading and she said well you better get out of the house because the whole valley's on fire so she said they dashed out and they saved nothing but the cars they have a lot of quite a few cars and the cars were stored in a metal building so they saved the cars and I was talking to Rick the other day about that, and he said that there was a Corvette out behind the, the barn that uh, after the fire was sitting there, but he went out and touched it. It just fell down. It was just it was just a shell. So he was quite fortunate to have saved this car, but he's got so many of them in, in the garage, he can't get in to take a picture of it. Uh, he said he would someday, but, but he doesn't have one yet. Um, so that, that's all we've got on that one. It's, um, it's a... Um, Saddle tan with saddle interior. And this is the one of the two that I did the inspection on it. Now this is number 21. Um, this, this job is, um, it was, uh, uh, well, it, my friend Fra Franz Esterreicher, I don't know if you know Franz, but Franz uh, owned this car and he sold it to um, Cool Cars LLC in Columbus, Ohio, and Bob uh, Dombrowski um bought it and then bob sold it to somebody that lives in tennessee but I, he can't find his file to tell me who it is so i got this picture from uh, franz and that's number 20. now this car chris howard from surrey united kingdom chris um is going to write a book about this car this this is a very very unique job it's got an SO number of 10271. And there were three of these built, one for the uh, London Auto Show, this one, and two more, just like it, for the Paris and the Turin Italy Show. Um, this uh, has a body tag of uh, A27, August the 27th. And the body tag says for paint color, it says prime. And for trim, it says black. But the trim, when, uh, when uh, uh, Chris got it, is silver. And when he uh, got into restoring it, underneath the silver trim is black trim. And it's got a, it's got a uh, um, 1957 V8 in it, engine, with the uh, SO number on the side of it. Um, so it, looks, it, it appears to be built from parts that were available probably in the engineering center. So um, it, it, 
Chris is going to write a, a book on it, so I'm not going to tell you much more than that. But um, he uh, he spent a lot of time and effort in this car. All right, this is the this is the um, assembly plant. That's a uh, machine. That's a drawing of the plant, actual drawing of the layout. You can see the various lines, how many jobs they hold, and it has a total of, of 131 jobs. Uh, when production was running at full capacity, it ran at six an hour. So six an hour to 131 jobs is about 22 hours from start to finish, uh, assuming not too much uh, delay for repairs between the chassis line and the paint repair line and so in, in that area. So um, so it takes about a day to two days for the repair and then of course so um, that gives a little, 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 little about that. Okay, here's my inspection report, my door gap inspection report. Uh, and those numbers on the left there, those are all 30 seconds of an inch. I went around I, and there's where I took the measurements and I did a statistical study and you can see that I have 16 and I have 20 there. Um, I took these from okay, I wanted okay jobs. I didn't want any, any um, um, uh, jobs that were not uh, completely bought off by inspection because I wanted to know what was going out the door. And these are the, this is the kind of variation that was in the door fits. The uh, red arrow there shows 520. That's the biggest number I found. So um, that's how that's about how many jobs were produced at that particular point. Um, most you know most of them had been shipped. There certainly weren't 500 jobs sitting on the floor, but there were probably 30 or 40 in repair at that time that were incompletes. We had, we had repair people working 12, 14 and hours a day. They fell asleep under the cars outside in the summertime is hot. And uh, the overtime was horrendous. Well, Lou Bishkak was the plant manager and he came down and he said, look guys, he said, if we can't, if we can't ship what we build in, in the hours that we build them, we're gonna start building four hours and we'll fix for our, our repair for four hours. He said, because starting Monday, this was like on Thursday or something. He said, starting Monday, there is no more overtime. And wouldn't, and of course, Lou grew up in a union. And uh, so wouldn't you know it, uh, on Monday, everything went, settled down and we had no more overtime. We were building what we, and we were repairing what we built in eight hours and everything was, was good. So um, Lou knew how to manage the union. The... Uh, This, this is a interesting, I got it in my book, I'm gonna put a fairly lengthy study about this. The bin, these, these, these uh, VINs all came off a line in order, 15, 16, 17, and 18. The bodies were, came, were in, went on the line, 15, six, five, six, seven, and eight in line. So there were no cars in between any of these. The body tag is play, put on the body in the first station of the trim line. And that's the date code that goes on it. So on August the 17th, but the body five and six entered the, the trim line. Then a few days later, so that's minimum two shifts or one day between within 16 and 17. If, if the, uh, Body tag was placed on 17 at the beginning of the day shift, and on 17 at the end of the day shift, it could be two shifts between it. That'd be max, but that's not likely. So more likely about four shifts or two days between the plant between those jobs. The minimum there's a minimum of six shifts or three days between 15 and 18. So it shows you how slow the plant's running. And, and that's more likely eight shifts or about four days between between the uh, 15 and 18 vents. So when people are trying to figure out the uh, birth date of their car, I think that's a fairly significant thing. So I guess we're doing okay, Tom. I got 
We got ten more minutes to make up our half an hour. You want me to talk about the T tops, or should we go for questions? Uh, go go uh, go ahead with the T tops. We'll have time for questions. Okay. Now, Paul Hazard. I met Paul at the uh, Chevrolet Engineering Center retirees group that meet every about four times a year uh, here in town, and learned that uh, he was the design engineer for this for the uh, T tops. The uh, Chevrolet re released a, a one piece T top for 1968 model. Um, but when they started designing it, they, f they learned that the, the, the body and the frame wasn't really strong enough to maintain proper dimension between the, the header, the windshield header and the B panel like roll bar. Um, and you know, uh, at that time, uh, uh, Porsche uh, had their Targa, which had a one piece roof. And they named it the Targa because um, they were pretty, Porsche was pretty uh, successful at the Targa Florio uh, race in Sicily. And so they called it a Targa. Um, so Chevrolet, I believe, wanted to compete with that. They wanted a, t they wanted a, uh, a Targa type roof. But since the testing uh, uh, wouldn't maintain a proper opening, um, with the uh, sectional roof, uh, this piece of the roof re uh, removed, they the engineers released a center dividing member from between the header, windshield header, and the uh, B body or the B pillar room part. So then, so that that's how the T top became. It was, it was not original. There's hard and the first few cars built. In fact, most of '68, the uh, Hard body mounts had to be used at positions one, two, and three, because that's the only way they could get the, the uh, opening stable. And I wasn't in the plant, but I uh, was in Detroit, and I did get involved a little bit with the T-top. And they leaked. They leaked water terribly. They were difficult to get in and off, uh, on and off of the car. Um, so they weren't very popular, at least in manufacturing. The frame was strengthened by the end of 68 model run, permitting the rubber mounts to be in position one, two, and three. So the T-top was, uh, was a challenge. And they didn't build, I think the first one built was uh, about serial number 18, and um, they didn't build very many. Okay, this, is, this next slide is one of my favorites. Uh, <clears throat> this is the last station on the final line before ship. Some of you gentlemen in the crowd here may have already heard me say this <clears throat> because I <coughs> like to put it on my presentations. Um, that guy standing back there in the circle is Don Etling. And I, my first day at Chevy was August the 16th, 62, Thursday, because we got paid at the middle and the end of the month. Well, Etling uh, got hired on the 20th, which was the following Tuesday, or Monday, I mean, the following Monday. So I, ha I had seniority on him by two days. Um, we were up in the office. We had an elevated office. We saw we saw a guy with a camera and a tripod down at the end of the line taking pictures. And Don ran down there as, as fast as he could, and he went over and stood over there, uh, as you can see him in that picture. And uh, I was standing behind the camera watching, and I thought it was kind of comical. But this this picture is uh, I see this picture everywhere. It's in Nolan Adams' book. So so Don got in the picture. Well, <clears throat> about. Six, eight months later, my boss, Glenn Huber, says um, they promoted they promoted uh, Don, gave him a foreman's job. So I asked my boss, I said, what's going on? I said, you know, Edling doesn't even, he doesn't like cars very much. He doesn't know anything about them. He uh, uh, says he doesn't want to work here any longer than he has to. Um, and why did you guys promote him? And they said, well, you know, Don's got a, a family. He's got a wife and kids. You're single. And um, he needed the money, so we, we gave him the job. I said, oh, that's, that's, that's really great, man. I, I feel a lot better now. <laughs> so so that, that's my Don Etling story. And I, um, it worked out better. I, I, I think I made out better because I got, to, I got a lot more visibility throughout the corporation 
and met a whole lot of people that Don would never have met as a foreman. So that's my story. 55 minutes, not too bad. I, I, I was a little concerned I would run over. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is Tom. Uh, if you see your own uh, box on the screen, please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, there's a chance for you to ask questions about Larry's presentation or make uh, additional comments. Uh, so, I, yeah, don't, don't, if, if you think I'm off base, don't be bashful. So, Tom, I got a question. Jim Williams here. Larry, great presentation. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, on the pictures you had with the tooling tryouts at the Van Slyke plant in Flint, did they build any cars there? Or was it merely body manufacturing, panel manufacturing, and then chassis confirmation? Well, um, they they had to build at least two or three of each convertible and coupe because the pictures, uh, if you look at the picture, in, in my book, I'm going to line the pictures up in sequential order so that uh, you can see that uh, there in one picture there's several uh, several jobs on the line in the pictures. So they they built cars. Um, uh, they uh, have there's pictures of a body drop. There's pictures of uh, um, engines and chassis. Um, uh, so uh, you know, uh, Chris Howard and I have discussed whether his number twenty three could have been one of those. And um, it could be, it could be, it's possible, I suppose. But his car was probably built before that. But at any rate, uh, yes, they built some. What happened to him? I don't know. Um, in those days, a, uh, um, cars like those could be sold. In fact, I, I have a, a memo that says about one of the uh, engineering built cars, they said to salvage it so they could sell it. Um, so that could not happen today. Absolutely could not happen. The reliability is way too, too much. So, um, I don't know what happened to those cars, but they did build some. Okay. Thanks. Yeah.